soon about time for the last session of the day. But I want to know who tasted the pastry with licorice. And did you like it? <laughs> All the hands went down. Okay. <laughs> did, did anybody did like not it? like nice. it? Is anybody brave enough to admit they did not like the licorice cake? Nobody is brave enough. Yes. All right. Um, so, yeah, I think we're almost ready to start. Let's just wait for the last people to trickle in. So this last session is a little bit different. You know, every session that we've had has had a unified theme. And this session was supposed to be theme audio. We have, you know, Terra will be introduced soon, and we were supposed to have uh, Ken Wheeler over, but unfortunately he couldn't make it on account of uh, he didn't want to. <laughs> no. <laughs> Yes, so the theme is audio and AI, but it's not particularly about AI over audio. It's uh, that our talk is not, you know, about AI. But we figured since this is the future front end conference, and I think AI is, is like a, you know, somewhat future, I think, rele relevant theme for all of us as engineers. Um, so we'll do the Q and A at the end, mainly focusing on. AI, not only AI as in, you know, the thing that I'll be talking about, just generally AI, you know, in, in our profession, in our industry, in the world. Uh, so, you know, Tero, myself, and uh, Stephanie Nemeth, who will be joining us for this, this, um, this session, we've all worked in or, or experimented with, uh, with AI in, in our different fields. So we're by no means experts, but we will be able to have a conversation about it. And we'd like you to participate in the conversation, of course. Um, so, you know, on the Slido, Slido, um, you know, using the code FF2023, um, you know, please direct any questions that you have about AI or comments or, you know, just something for us to, to discuss about. And we might even actually run mics over to, to have you guys participate um, in, the, in the chat. So, yeah, mainly questions about AI. If you do have questions about uh, Tero's presentation, um, you know, Tero will, uh, you know, be around and you can just talk to him. And uh, he's a very, very nice man and very nice to talk to. So uh, you can ask him questions personally. Um, but I think without further ado, it is my uh, time to bequeath my MC badge. Switch the hat. Yes. Uh, uh, oh, yes. Uh, the, yes. I, I am, you know, for the next session, I am a speaker, not an MC, so I will now skulk off the stage and I will yeah. leave Dooley to it. Uh, see you in a bit. Yeah, since Tero is already, already ready, I wouldn't need to fill this space with uh, my mumbling, but I will still say a few words of this local multi talent. Uh, he got tired of software development and decided to start making music because, I mean, that's what you do. And then he combined those two, and now he has a company, Counterpoint, with his friends. So let's give it up for Tero. Thank you very much, Tuuli. Um, it's a privilege to be with you today. I am actually just being reminded what it's like to be on stage because I haven't done a conference talk in a few years, and it is a strange and interesting feeling to get in front of people and try and say words that make sense. Um, but I'll, I'll do my best, and I think we'll have some fun here. I've been looking forward to this because this is a topic I care deeply about. I spend pretty much all my time on this, and that is the topic of music in general. Uh, more specifically, I want to talk about some tools that allow us to incorporate music and sound into web applications. Uh, which might be for various purposes, from doing just some UI sound to, to in some app, to making games and other interactive media, all the way to making full-blown uh, music production environments and things like that. And by incorporating music to web apps, I, in, in this case, I don't just mean dropping in a, an audio file and playing that back. I mean including code in web apps that um, can generate audio in real time and as such uh, is able to um, adapt to what the user is doing, what's happening in the world, and it's all kind of happening right there in the browser. So I run a company called CounterPoint, as, as Tuli mentioned. Uh, we are basically a two-person technology slash design studio, um, do mainly project-based work, uh, largely around music technology and and the arts in general, uh, so we do lots of artworks, um, also brand experiences of various kinds, educational tools, um, 
functional music systems for things like psychotherapy and sleep and things like that. And we work kind of mostly, I would say, on, on the web. So we mostly do web-based software, but we have found ourselves also building all kinds of uh, physical interactive pieces with different people that actually exist as, as objects in the world. Um, and one of the tools we have found ourselves using several times over these few years is this one called Max MSP. Now, just a show of hands, how many people have an inkling of what Max MSP is or have heard of it? It's about maybe 10 people. Excellent. I get to talk about something that's probably new to most people then. Um, Max is essentially a visual note based programming language and a software environment for making multimedia applications. Uh, mostly music and sound, but also visuals, also other kinds of things that occur in time, such as light installations and things like that. It is not a new product. Uh, it's existed since, I think, the late 80s, so I believe it literally predates the web. It's a very kind of a venerable uh, program, has existed for a long time. And in the core of this, the paradigm that Max represents is the idea of making the creation of software be more like performing music than, than engineering, really. You have a very kind of immediate mode interaction with a system that's reacting to what you're doing in real time. You can listen, listen to and see the results right away when you do different things. And this allows for a kind of explorative software development that's really important to me and also lots of people, people I find. And here's a testimony from one of the, I would say, more famous Max users, Sean Booth. The thing I like about Max is that it lets me try out lots and lots of different things and then figure out which ones work. And I think that's quite a productive way of working. It's not, a lot of people think that you have to have this kind of, you know, strong conceptual idea that you then realize, and that makes you creative. But I don't, I don't think that being creative should be the goal, actually. I think that making good work should be the goal. And quite often, just doing a lot of random shit and then noticing that something's amazing can produce better work. Just that's what experience has shown. So, you know, I'm not saying it would work like that for everyone, but I don't do the kind of having, having a way to do things and then doing the things. It's just too boring for me. That is a kind of engineering philosophy I have taken to heart as well. I just, you know, do random shit and then notice when something's amazing and just continue doing that. Oh, thank you. Um, Autiker, as far as I know, has done pretty much all of their music since the turn of the millennium uh, with Max. So when they do records, they, they build their own instruments and software that they then, then produce the music with. And when they go on tour, they perform with all, all of their own software, which is part of the reason why they don't sound like anyone else. They don't use the same instruments as anyone else. They have their own system. And there's lots of people who do that now, so Max is quite popular among, say, electronic music uh, scenes in general, people who do interactive art. Um, one, one version of it is actually baked into Ableton Live, which is one of the popular digital audio workstations, so people can use Max to extend, build effects and instruments since inside there. And it's used by various artists to make make their own instruments, make generative music, make installations and, and all kinds of things. The bottom left here is an installation we did with Dutti Arola a few years ago next door on the Senate Square called Robot Choir. But anyway, so when you work in Max, what you always build is one of these things. It's called, it's called a patch. Essentially, it's a network a graph of, of nodes connected together with signals flowing through them, uh, with some inputs and outputs that produce some sort of audible or visual result. And what you do is you run it inside Max MSP, the application, which is a licensed application you can run on Mac or Windows. Now that in itself has been largely a limiting factor for what kinds of things you can use Max for, and it's probably a reason why a lot of people here aren't familiar with it because 
it can't be used traditionally for any software of the kind that we do, which is actually deployed out into the world to be used by uh, larger groups of people. Because you can't put it on the web, you can't put it in a mobile device, you can't send it to your friends even because they might not have Macs because almost no one has Macs. So it's kind of tied to this runtime that needs to be, uh, that you need to have to be able to run these, which makes it useful for the kinds of use cases I've been talking about, but not for others. Now, this is where Rainbow comes in now. This is a new thing that came out late last year from the same company that makes Max Cycling 74. And this is essentially a um, extension to Max, which lets you do this kind of thing, make your patch, and then compile it down into C++ or WebAssembly, uh, which is, doesn't have any dependencies to Max or anything else, and then can run anywhere where you, can, where you can run that kind of code. So today I'm going to mostly focus on the web case, making a WebAssembly app and running it in the browser. You can also run the C++ code incorporated into native apps, native mobile apps. You can run it in, say, a Lambda function that uh, can run C++. You can put it in semi-embedded environments like Raspberry Pi. So for example, if you want to make a guitar effect, uh, put it in a box uh, untethered from your laptop, you can do that. And people are doing that. So I'm going to concentrate on the web case today, though, for obvious reasons. Uh, a couple of examples of, of that. Uh, from Ableton, there's this website called Learning Synths, which is a really cool, interactive kind of um, educational site for teaching you the fundamentals of uh, sound synthesis for music. And it has a massive amount of different visualizations, interactive tools that let you kind of explore it and, and learn it. And they did all the audio production for this in a rainbow patch, which is then compiled to WebAssembly, runs in your browser in the web audio worklet inside there. And then they built this UI that you can control um, it with real time, in, in real time. A project we've been working on this year at CounterPoint, we are doing this kind of generative music platform uh, with Tom Middleton. Uh, we have a client in Germany who wants to incorporate some like endless electronic music streams into their uh, iOS and Android apps, which they have built in React Native. And what we are doing for them is we are using Rainbow to create these music systems and provide them with essentially NPM packages that they can install into their iOS and Android uh, React Native apps. And then we also compile that same Rainbow code onto WebAssembly for all this kind of internal tooling that we use inside the team, such as this one for, for mixing and mastering. It's running the same um, generative music system that gets shipped to the actual users, but just this in, in an internal version of like this custom UI in this case that we've made with um, React that allows us to internally in the team and like tweak it and explore it. Through. So that's a couple of examples. Um, I really want to spend the bulk of my time today, though, um, just showing you how it works, actually, because it's one thing to talk about how this is interactive and cool and, and interesting, but another thing to actually show how that workflow feels like. Um, so I'm going to try to do a little live uh, coding here. I have no idea what it's going to sound like, because I realize this room has a quite a big reverb here, and it's all, all kind of very... Um, big, uh, but let's see how, see how it sounds like and try to kind of uh, work with the ethos of Max, which is to just stay in the moment and react to whatever we hear and see, see where that gets us. Um, so my idea for a little app I want to make today is this kind of thing that would let me put, put something on my phone, in the browser on my phone, and use the microphone on the phone to um, listen to the environment, say in Helsinki, Sounds like traffic, construction, people talking, city noises, and turn those noises into some sort of ambient soundscape for my headphones, so I can like listen, sample the environment with my phone, and have some sort of nice, nice um, soothing, hopefully, uh, sounds in my ears. So that's the brief. Let's see what we can do here. I have Max running here on my laptop. And I'm going to start a new patch here, which gives me an empty 
workspace. And here I'm going to first of all set up an object that represents my sound card, which has a left and a right output, and this will go through the analog uh, plug I have on this, this laptop, the sound system in the room here. And then I should have an input, so I can make um, sorry, a microphone input here, but since I'm not using my headphones at the moment, I am not going to actually use live microphone input in, in the interest of not making sound feedback in the room and just not make it too hard for our engineer here to kind of deal with audio feedback. Um, instead, I'm going to use a file that I have obtained of like a pre-recorded soundscape uh, that will act as a test harness for us here. So I'll just open a file into that here. I've got a couple of files here. I'll just use this one to load in there. Then I'll make a rainbow object which, into which um, I'm going to put all the actual code that gets compiled for the web. So that opens up another patch window here for all that stuff that is going to be cross-compiled with the rainbow system. And this one is going to have one input, sorry, one audio input, which represents the microphone stream, and two outputs, one for the left speaker, and one for the right speaker. And to begin with, I am just going to pass the input through here so we can hear what that sounds like. And over here, I'm going to connect the file player into this rainbow object and its outputs to the headphones. And then I'll make a little button here to turn this file player on, and maybe we'll start hearing something now. Indeed. So that's going to be our placeholder sound for a live input. And now we can start thinking about how we can process that sound to make it a little bit more interesting. Uh, the thing I'm going to do first is I'll make something called a comb filter, which is essentially, it's like an audio processing primitive that's essentially a very, very short delay line of only a few milliseconds long that repeats the sound that's given to it very quickly. So quickly, in fact, that it starts to resonate at a, at a frequency of its own that's dependent on how long that delay line is. So if I make it, say, 10 milliseconds long, I'm going to use no gain on it. Uh, forward gain of 0.5, feedback gain of 0.96. Just magic numbers you can play with if you, if you are interested in trying this out. Plug that in, and we start to hear resonance on one of the speakers. And I'll just also do that for the right channel, so we can hear it on both. So that's a start. It's maybe a little bit more rough than I would like it to be, so I may want to just use a low-pass filter here to shave off some of the high-end frequencies from there to make it a bit more mellow. Insert that in there. So it's a lot more boomy, less sharp now. And maybe I'll just do just another one of those here so we really don't have any high-end at all. So now we have a resonant frequency going that's kind of live generated from the sound input that we have going. And as I said, the length of the delay line here is, is uh, related to the frequency of resonance that we hear. I would like that to actually be adjustable. Uh, so maybe I can have a UI where I can tweak the kind of pitch or the kind of uh, the frequencies of the, of the sounds I'm hearing. So I'm going to introduce a parameter for that. I'm going to call that root, uh, which might by default be 100 hertz, and I'll allow it to vary between 50 and 200 hertz. So here I have a frequency. Here I will need um, a wave period, a delay line length. So I need to kind of turn one into the other here. And I can do that by inverting this number, which is a way of saying I want to divide 1,000 milliseconds by this hertz value to get the length of the delay line in milliseconds that I want. 
So once I've done that, I'll have a UI here on the top level called root, which allows me to tweak that frequency. Like that. Now, to make this a bit more interesting harmonically, I would like to have some more notes running here, maybe not just the one, but maybe a full chord of, of harmonic information. And that I can do by introducing some more comb filters in series, or just in, not in series, but in, in parallel here. So I'll make another one, and I can feed a different frequency into it. So maybe I'll make that this one be an octave higher than the other one, which is a way of saying a double the frequency. So if I plug that in, and then also plug in the audio input as well as output, we can hear the, like a, another sound there, an octave above the other one. And maybe I'll also go and add a perfect fifth while we're at it. Let's just do some more. This one is going to be the input multiplied by three over two, which is a, a pure perfect fifth harmony. Again, let's do the connections to get the audio in and out. There we go. And then I'm going to do one more, and then I'll promise I'll stop doing this. Um, a major sixth. 5 over 3 to so have like a full chord in here yeah maybe that that'll do um, the next thing I want to try is start to play with the kind of time dimension of this a little bit because we are hearing these events come in and they are being resonated um, to get a more kind of smoother ambience going, I'd like to maybe delay some of those sounds slightly and have them echo around for a while before they leave, uh, just to make it more textural. And I can do audio delays by just having a delay node here, um, which will do what it says. Uh, it will delay the audio by some amount of time, such as 24,000 samples, which is about half a second. If I plug that into the left channel here, we should hear our left speaker being about half a second behind the right one. Um, but that's not all I wanted to do. I wanted to have an echo where the sounds stay for a while and kind of repeat. So what I need to do to achieve that is feed this delay back into itself to kind of have the relayed sound come back and then come back again and back again. But I don't want to, that to happen forever. I wanted to make, make it more quiet every time so it doesn't like keep building and the sounds actually do leave at some point. So I need to attenuate that signal for, for a bit every time it comes back. So I'll just multiply it by uh, 0.8, which makes it slightly quieter. Then use a feedback node, which allows me to then make a loop back into here. So it, we start to get that, feed, um, that kind of build up of sound in the left speaker. I'll also do that for the right speaker. Maybe use a different length of delay to make it a little bit more interesting, have different sounds happening in the left and right speakers. So this one will go through there. And maybe I'll also make this into a ping-pong delay, which means literally ping-ponging the sounds between the left and right, which can be achieved by taking the feedback from the left channel, feeding it into the right channel. this cable let's just delete that and do it to a new one that will work better and same here right one to the left one and maybe let's start from the left one only so we should be hearing hearing a kind of um, bouncing of the sound between the speakers, which sounds even cooler when you have headphones on.
And then there's maybe one more thing I'd like to do, which is a very important aspect of any kind of ambient music system, which is reverb, to kind of make it softer and more spatial. Um, we do have a very beautiful reverb in this room already, so we kind of maybe don't strictly need one, but I can't really take that reverb with me, so I'll just make a, make a synthetic one to, to work with my headphones. Now, it happens that there isn't really just a reverb node I can drop in here that would be built into Rainbow, um, nor am I going to start making one because that'll take all day. Instead, I'm going to jump into the Max Package Manager and get a third-party reverb for, for myself here. And I get one from a package called Rainbow Guitar Pedals. This is essentially a collection of patches that is designed for people to be able to make their own custom guitar pedals and put them in things like Raspberry Pis and, and, things, like, and things like that to, to make their own uh, pedal boxes. But I can just as well use these same algorithms on a web-based project, which I'll do now. There's a plate reverb here that I like. I'm going to open that, which opens for me this documented patch for it. I'll open the rainbow code from here, and then I'm going to literally copy-paste that to my own patch. So I've got that copied now. I'm going to close all these things, and then make a sub-patch where I can paste that in. Which gives me a reverb, which I could now customize to my liking, but I, I'm just going to use, use it this unchanged because it, it'll work for us nicely. I'll call that reverb, so I'll remember what that is, and then plug it in to our audio chain here after the delay. Left and right channels. This also gives me some new parameters here to tweak, which are those of the reverb itself. So if I go and look in here, I'll have, say, a reverb mix, uh, which will want to make quite high, because, because we want most of this sound to be reverberated and not much of the original signal in there. So if I can take that up to 90, it'll be more wet. And we really want a quite a big reverb here. Not the size, but the decay is the one I want to play with, because that um, controls how long the sound takes to decay away. And I want to increase that. There we go. Lots of space. As you can tell, probably I could do this all day, but I'm going to stop there because I want to get to the web, web part as well and show how you can take this from this environment and put it in the browser. So in VS Code here, I have essentially an empty web application, which has you know, an HTML file with nothing much in it, JavaScript file with nothing much in it, as a basis for, for this app, and I'm, have, I have it running here in my browser as well. So what I'll do is, back in Max, I'm going to jump into the export sidebar and do a web export of this patch, and choose a folder that points to a subdirectory of, of the web project I have. Just export that. And what that will do is it'll first compile, it, compile all this code down to C++, and then using mscript and uh, onwards to uh, WASM into a big web, web assembly uh, blob that I can then uh, load into my browser. I'm also going to install um, whoops, a library called Rainbow JS, which gives me a nice JavaScript API to, for interacting uh, with this, with this uh, web assembly package. Then I'm ready to get coding some JavaScript here. So I'll make, first of all, an, an audio context 
just a standard web audio context where all the audio will run. And then I'll make a little async, well, I say I will make, Copilot will make for me a little async initializer function. Live coding on stage isn't what it used to be, I'll say that. Um, well, yeah, here I will actually load things up. So first of all, I'm going to load this code that was just exported in Max earlier, and that I can do with just fetching it. So slash rainbow slash patch dot export dot JSON, and then the JSON of that response. Then I'll just import the rainbow JS library. It has a function called create device which takes an audio context and this patcher, the code package, and makes for me a so-called um, rainbow device. It's almost correct, like that. Um, take, given an audio context and this code, it gives me this device object that runs all that DSP code in the browser, in the audio context, in a worklet for me, and it gives me an API to, to um, talk to it. And then I should think about the inputs and outputs of the, this device. So first of all, I want the output of that audio node in there to be routed to my sound card, which happens like this, just taking it to the standard audio context destination. And then for the input, uh, it's a bit more tricky because I want to use the microphone. Um, so what I essentially, essentially want is a UI where I have a button that when I press it down, it'll open up a microphone input, feed that into my so-called reverberation chamber, and when I release the button, it'll stop doing that and kind of close it up again. So first of all, I'll just make a button here in the DOM. Let's call that engage, uh, like that. Shows up in here. Then I'll grab that, uh, engage and add some handlers on it, pointer down and pointer up uh, for doing these functionalities that I just described. So what I want to do is open up a microphone stream and I can do that with the Media Devices API. I can get a microphone stream from that. The thing about it is I need to do it here uh, inside the pointer down function. I can't do it in the initializer because of browser permissions. You can't open a microphone stream without a user interaction. So I'll need to do a bit of async uh, stuff here to get that kind of lazily initialized on the first button press. So I'll have a mic node which I will initialize here the first time the pointer is pressed. And I'll just make that async so I can do async stuff. What I want to do is get a microphone stream from media devices, get user media, and then turn that into a web audio node using a media stream source. This is all standard web audio stuff, by the way, nothing to do with Rainbow specifically, just things you do with web, web audio in general. But this essentially gives me um, the microphone stream in a web audio node that I can then connect onwards. And I what I wanted to do is have that be fed into my rainbow device when my button is pressed. And to, to control that on and off state, I'm going to also make a gain node here, which is a web audio way of controlling volume, basically. So I'll make a gain, make that zero at first, connect that to my rainbow input. So doing essentially the JavaScript equivalent of what I was doing here, which is the input to Rainbow. And then the output goes to the destination, and then what I need to do here finally is connect the microphone to the gain. And now what I have this gain to play with, so I can turn it on when the button is pressed, turn it back off when the, the button is released. And the final thing I want to make sure I do here is I had these parameters here in my max code, which I would also want to control from the JavaScript in a similar way. 
Um, so I'll just do that maybe right here. The device will have a parameters by ID map, which has parameters and matching the same names as, as the max code has here, which are defined by these param nodes. So we have a root that we can put to say 150 hertz. We have um, reverb mix, which we can put into 80. And a reverb decay that we can put into 90. And then I think I need to do just one more thing, which is to make sure this audio context is running, which also needs to be done because of browser policies from an explicit user interaction. So I'll need to do that here. Resume the context. Now we can maybe see if that does anything. I'll just load the page. We have no errors here. Let me just try and press this button. Hello? Hello? Nice. Maybe a bit loud. I'll let that gain go to only like 0.3 maybe. To make it a bit more quiet. It's working. It's working. Nice. There we go. So I have a button I can take with me when I go leave here and start listening to my environment with ambient uh, harmonies. Obviously, as I said, a lot could be done to make this more interesting. For one thing, I would love to make some different chords here uh, to build up the harmony over time, change it, maybe add some synthesis, like sub-bass sine oscillator, for example, to add some like low end, making the sound much more rich and, you know, sky's the limit. And, and as I said earlier, the, the part the, that's fun with Max is that you can do it here, like in a very immediate way. Try different things out, listen to what it sounds like, follow the things that sound nice or seem to be going somewhere, abandon other things. Uh, that's a very kind of fun way of working. And then you can take all that, put it on a web page, put it in a mobile app, and just deploy it wherever you want. If you found that interesting, a couple of references. Rainbow.cycling74.com is the, the, the kind of documentation site for Rainbow. They have really good documentation for it videos, all kinds of things, showcases for what you can do with it, including the guitar pedals and all, all kinds of things. A um, couple of book recommendations uh, that, that are Max books. There aren't really any books for Rainbow just yet, since it just came out half a year ago. But when you learn the Max paradigm using Max books or Max tutorials, that um, translates quite readily to, to Rainbow as well. And also my favorite part about Max really, or say one of the favorite parts is, the fact that there's a really good help system in there. So if I open any node here and get the help for it, I'll get an interactive patch that, I can, that explains to me what the inputs and outputs are, what I can do with it, and lets me kind of play with it. And that is a really effective way of learning these different nodes and their capabilities, just like poking them and seeing what happens. But yeah, that's what I wanted to share today. Um, Thank you for your time. <laughs>